Hi, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm a professor at Imperial College London and head of GraphML research at Twitter. I would like to talk today about deep learning on graphs. Graphs are a convenient mathematical abstraction for systems of relations and interactions. So you can find them in a broad range of applications across sciences and engineering. And this possibility of applying deep learning on graph structured data is very appealing. I will discuss today some of the foundations of these methods, their recent successes, and most importantly, the future challenges and open problems. Allow me to start with taking a step back and talking about the concept of inductive bias, which is a fundamental notion in learning, and it refers to the set of assumptions that a machine learning system makes about the problem and the data when it is applied to previously unseen input. And let's take a very simple machine learning system, actually the earliest neural networks called perceptrons. We know that they can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy with just one hidden layer. We call this property universal approximation. It sounds like a good piece of news because we can represent anything we want with multi-layer perceptrons, they are very expressive. But the moment we try to apply these models to real high dimensional data such as images, they tend to fail miserably. Let's look, for example, at the problem of digit classification, probably one of the canonical or classical problems in computer vision. Essentially, we want to say whether what we see here is the digit three. How can we do it? Just stack the image into a vector and pass it as input to a multi-layer perceptron. What happens when we now have another instance of the same image, where the digit has just moved by one pixel? The input will be very different because our neural network is completely unaware about the structure of the image and thinks of it as a one-dimensional vector. So it will take a lot of examples and very complex architecture with a lot of parameters to learn invariance to shifts from the data. And early attempts to apply neural networks to image data failed exactly because of this reason. The breakthrough in using neural networks for images has come from the right inductive bias. And these are convolutional neural networks from the seminal work of Jan de Kahn, where the inductive bias is what we call translation equivariance. And it is hardwired into the architecture in the form of shared local weights. Now, let me show you a different problem. What you see here is a molecule. If you're interested in the molecule of caffeine, many of us, including myself, are very good. I would dare say even intimate familiarity with it. We can model, the, model it as a graph. The nodes represent the atoms and the edges represent the chemical bonds. Let's say that we want to predict some chemical property of this molecule, for example, what a chemist would call the atomization energy. How do we represent this molecule? We can just again take the features of the nodes and put them into a vector like we did before with an image. But the problem is that now we have many more ways to do it than before. Actually, any permutation of the nodes produces a valid representation. And the kind of invariance we want to have here is very different from the previous example with shifts. We need permutation invariance. Molecules are just one example of graph structured data. And in fact, we see graphs everywhere. Probably the most prominent examples are social networks where the nodes are users and edges are social relations or interactions between them. But we also encounter graphs or networks in biological sciences where we look at the interactions between biomolecules such as proteins in computer graphics and computer vision where we use graphs with maybe a bit more structure such as meshes to represent three-dimensional objects in brain imaging where the graphs model functional networks and many, many more applications. So if you want the gist of what deep learning on graphs is, it's essentially about finding the right inductive bias for graph structure data, sometimes what is called the relational inductive bias. In 2016, we wrote a position paper with Jan de Kahn, Pierre van der Geist, Joan Bruna, and Arthur Schlamm, where we connected several attempts to deal with non-Euclidean structure in deep learning, which we named geometric deep learning. And this term is now used synonymously with graph deep learning and graph representation learning, but there is actually more to it. You can think of geometric deep learning as a framework unifying what we call the four Gs. These are grids, graphs, groups, and gauges. This year, graph neural networks have officially become one of the hottest topics in machine learning, at least judging from the submission statistics of a clear one of the main conferences in machine learning. And 
In order to understand what is different and what is similar about graph neural networks, let's look at classical CNNs. They take as input an image, which we can define as some function on the two-dimensional grid. I denote it by x here. Think of the color of the pixels. And what convolution does is a weighted aggregation of the values of the pixels in the neighborhood. We can do the same thing in a graph. The neighbors will be the nodes that are attached by edges to my node. And so far, it looks exactly the same. One thing to notice is that when we move to a different location, we still have a constant number of neighbors because the grid is regular. In this case, each pixel is connected to just four neighbors. On a graph, we might have very different number of neighbors. We had six neighbors in the previous node and now five for this one. And if you think of social networks, this difference can actually be dramatic. Some popular users might have millions of followers and common mortals like myself, maybe just a few thousands. We call this the no degree and we can vary a lot across the graph. Another thing to observe is that on the grid we have a fixed ordering of the neighbors. We can always talk about the node to the left, a node to the right, and this allows to always apply the same weight to the first node, to the second node, and so on. And this is exactly the weight sharing in convolutional neural networks that I mentioned before. If you represent it as a matrix, we see a special structure that emerges. We call it circuit matrix. And because circuit matrices commute, we also have commutativity with the shift, which is also a circuit matrix. And this property is called shift equivariance. That's exactly the inductive bias of CNNs. On the graph, the situation is very different. The ordering of the neighbors is completely arbitrary. So we don't have a canonical way of assigning a fixed weight to a node. And this actually makes graph neural networks quite different from traditional CNNs. So here is a blueprint for how to do convolution-like operations on graphs. And this is how most of graph neural networks look like. When we have two types of operation, we can aggregate information or the features from our neighbors. And we can process these features in some way and update the features of our node. So these are the two operations, aggregate and update. Aggregate takes the most general form of a function that is applied to the multi-set of neighbor node features. And importantly, this function is permutation invariant for the reason I mentioned that there is no canonical ordering of the neighbors. And there are some particular examples of important graph neural networks where, for example, linear aggregation of the nodes uh, can be applied. You can think of it as a node-wise transformation of the features by some linear operation followed by linear diffusion that does local mixing of the node features of the graph. And this is a popular architecture called GCN or graph convolutional network that has originated from earlier works on spectral graph convolutions. We can also do something a little bit more complex, still linearly aggregated all features, but make the weights depend on the features. And this idea is called graph attention. Let's now look more into details of what is similar and what is different in graph neural networks compared to traditional deep learning pipelines. If we look historically at the development of convolutional neural networks, we can see that early models such as AlexNet from 2012 were relatively shallow. In AlexNet, for example, we have eight layers and relatively large filters of up to 11 by 11 pixels. And as CNNs became more commonplace in computer vision, the community has chosen to go deeper and use smaller filters, as small as three by three pixels in this example of VGG architecture from 2014. And there are several reasons why these happened. First of all, obviously, smaller filters are much more computation efficient than bigger ones. But second, most importantly, it was shown that in convolutional neural networks, we can construct complex features from simple ones, a property that is called compositionality. And usually, it's visualized by showing that in the early layers of the convolutional neural network, we see simple structures such as edges and corners. And as we go deeper, we see some more complex elaborate features emerge. Now, this appears not to be the case in graph neural networks, and it is really wishful thinking to compose complex structures from simple ones. It doesn't always work. For example, it was shown recently that graph neural networks of the message passing type, as I shown, are equivalent to what is called the Weisferer Lemon or WL graph isomorphism test. And it's a classical algorithm from graph theory that tests if two graphs are isomorphic by means of a color refinement procedure. And it is known that it cannot, for example, count triangles in graphs. So it's, uh, it's a necessary but insufficient condition that can tell you that the graphs are not isometric for sure, but possibly isometric otherwise. This tells us that even 
such simple structures as triangles, which are crucial in some types of networks, cannot be constructed from more primitive structures. I should say that there exist higher order and more powerful versions of the WL test. And I would like to point to, in particular, to the works of Hagai Maron from Weizmann on high dimensional uh, GNNs that are equivalent to these tests, but they have significantly higher computational and memory complexity. And what is probably worse, they're non-local. So, as I said, there are certain graph quantities we cannot compute by means of message passing, no matter how deep we make our neural network. And I should say that this matter is not fully understood. And on the contrary, there are examples of properties such as graph moments that cannot be computed unless the network has certain minimum depths. What we can do is to help the graph neural network to count substructures that are otherwise impossible to detect by providing these counts as some pre-computed feature vectors, a kind of structural node encoding. And we do this by pre-counting these substructures of size k and these could be, for example, triangles or cliques or cycles or paths of different length. And we provide them as node or edge features and then do standard message passing. We call this architecture graph subtraction, uh, subtraction network or GSN. And this computation might be expensive. In the worst case, it costs n to the power k, where n is the number of nodes and k is the size of the substructure. So the worst case complexity is as in high dimensional bisphere element tests, but the message passing itself is linear and what is most important, it is local. So in practice, for some structures such as triangles and cycles, we can have significantly lower complexity as well as approximate randomized algorithms with sometimes even error bounds. But what we gain in this way is that GSM is strictly more powerful than the message passing neural networks that are equivalent to the WL test. And another way of looking at it is that we have a problem specific inductive bias because in some settings, and some types of problems, we know a priori what structures matter and are important. And if we exploit these inductive biases, we can get in some cases state of their performance. And as an example, in social networks, cliques or triangles tend to have importance and sometimes they may be even interpretable from the sociological standpoint. In chemical data sets, on the other hand, cycles are an important motif and it is abundant in organic molecules with structures such as aromatic rings. And again, let me show you my favorite molecule of caffeine. Here it has uh, two rings of size five and of size six. And if we uh, inject this structure into GSNs, we get a significant gain in the performance of predicting chemical properties of molecular graphs. And the results shown are from the zinc data set that is used for virtual screening of drug-like compounds. In the remaining time, let me share some thoughts on what I believe to be the next steps in the field of deep learning or graphs. And here I would like to make a confession. I'm disappointed. When I started working on geometric deep learning, probably around six years ago now, I was expecting to see a kind of revolution that has happened in computer vision. And we have not seen anything similar yet. And of course, yes, uh, GraphML has been successful in many settings. And uh, there are even examples of commercial users among which I shamelessly put my startup Fabio AI that I co-founded with my students and sold to Twitter last year, where we used uh, graph neural networks to detect, detect fake news on social media. But overall, it has been more of a, an evolution, even though a very fast one, rather than a revolution. And let me try to explain what, in my opinion, is still missing and holding us back. There are three things that made deep learning happen. And this holy trinity has been named an infinite number of times. And this is data compute and software. In the case of computer vision, the data was ImageNet, a collection of millions of annotated images. The computing power came from graphics hardware, GPUs, that are very well tailored for convolutional neural networks. And the software was open source tools such as PyTorch or TensorFlow that has democratized deep learning. If we look at the situation in graph learning, we somewhat lag behind. We don't really have a standardized benchmark that uh, is similar to ImageNet in the scale and complexity. And I should add that for graphs, the diversity of problems is much greater compared to computer vision. One of the issues is that many interesting graphs, especially large scale real life graphs, are owned by a handful of companies. Uh, I will not name them. You know all these names by heart probably. 
And these companies are rather reluctant to give this data away, in part due to draconian legislation such as GDPR that has recently been introduced. At Twitter, actually, we have recently provided one of the largest graph data sets in the industry, covering about 150 million user engagements as part of the Rexis challenge. And I hope that we'll see more data coming out of the industry in the future. I would say that one big progress is the Open Graph Benchmark that was launched about a year ago and is spearheaded by the Stanford group of Curie Leskowitz. It is probably uh, the de facto standard, or at least it will soon become a de facto standard in the field in the future. The second pillar is software libraries. And here again, the situation nowadays is much more optimistic than it used to be a couple of years ago. We now have uh, professionally maintained libraries such as DGL that is uh, supported by Amazon. Efficiency and scalability, I have already touched upon this topic. This is one of the issues that so far has precluded the application of graph neural networks in industrial settings. And if you look at problems at Twitter or Facebook, one thing is the scale of the graphs that we need to deal with. Sometimes they have hundreds of millions of nodes and billions of edges. And many methods in the academic literature are simply no goal for these settings. So it's relatively recently that the community has started looking at scalability problems for graph neural networks. Another important issue is that graphs in many applications are not static. Take again the example of Twitter, this graph is living, uh, nodes are added, deleted, edges are created when somebody tweets, retweets or follows, and so on and so forth. Parts of the graph change at different speeds. So the right way of thinking of these problems is a continuous time dynamic graph or a stream of asynchronous events such as nodes or edge insertion and deletions. And there are currently very few architectures that support these cases. Uh, so with my colleagues at Tira, we've developed a temporal graph networks. It's an architecture that generalizes message passing neural networks for settings where the graph is formed as a sequence of timestamp events. And the special part of the architecture is the encoder, which you can train in self-supervised way, for example, to predict future edges. And then the decoder can be task specific. For example, you can create node embeddings that can be used for applications such as classifying the nodes. Again, in social network settings, this could be trying to detect some bad users or predicting edges, the, which gives you the capability to predict engagements. And this is bread and butter of recommender systems. High order structures, I've already mentioned them in the context of our work on GSN and would like to stress again, so far graph neural networks have been about nodes and edges with different variations on the message passing theme. And we know that in many complex networks, especially biological or social networks, we have complex high order structures and motifs such as triangles, clicks, and so on. And GSN does probably the simplest, most naive thing, augmenting the message passing architecture with structure-based descriptors. But we can think of more complex message passing architectures where the aggregation happens over higher dimensional structures. And there are interesting connections to computational topology and constructions such as simplicial complexes and persistent homology. So, uh, so far have been largely unexplored and practically unknown in machine learning field. Another important topic is actually the very assumption that we are given an input graph to start with. In many cases, this is not the situation. And the typical setting, for example, are biological problems where these graphs, such as protein to protein interaction or PPI graph, are acquired experimentally, are expensive, and as a result, are known only partially. And in other settings, are not known at all. It is possible to design graph neural networks that build the graph as part of the learning process. And together with my collaborators from MIT, we did the first realization of such architectures, which we call dynamic graph CNNs, probably not the best name. And the graph in these architectures is constructed on the fly using k nearest neighbors and can also be updated between layers because the graph is really dependent on the downstream task. So we can build the best graph that suits the task in the optimal way. And then this brings an important question of whether the computational graph that is used for message passing in graph neural networks has necessarily to be the same as the input graph, if the input graph is given at all. And there are many good reasons why we want to do it. We decouple the, the two, uh, two things, one of which are 
the bottleneck phenomena that are observed in graph neural networks. In recent work uh, with collaborators from Munich, we applied latent graph uh, learning, uh, basically these architectures which learn the graph as part of the process, uh, using healthcare electronic records, or we have patient data that comes in the form of demographic features such as age, sex, etc., and imaging features from, for example, brain scans. And graph neural networks were applied before to these kind of problems, for example, to diagnose neurological diseases on a graph of patients uh, that was constructed by hand from demographic features. With the dynamic graph CNNs, we learn the way to construct the graph, and it is obviously task dependent. And we show that using this construction, we can significantly improve the performance of disease classification. For example, predict if the patient has Alzheimer's disease. Thinking in retrospective, this kind of methods is related to what was called meaningful learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which was a popular class of machine learning algorithms about 20 years ago when I myself was a student. The premise of meaningful learning is that we have data that indeed lives in very high dimensional space, but it has low intrinsic dimension, or in other words, it can be explained by a few degrees of freedom. And the convenient metaphor is to think that the data is sampled from a low dimensional manifold, such as this Swiss roll surface. The blueprint of manifold learning algorithms uh, therefore consists of three stages. First, they build the representation of the low dimensional structure, usually in the form of a nearest neighbor graph, then create a low dimensional representation of the data, for example, in ISOMAP, one of the popular algorithms in this class, uh, trying to preserve the geodesic distances on the graph. And finally, once you get this low dimensional representation, you apply some form of machine learning, which typically used to be clustering. Graph neural networks offer a modern take on this problem, and that's why I call them manifold learning 2.0. You can bring all these steps into a single pipeline. So you build the graph and perform machine learning directly on this graph in an end-to-end -end way. And I call this problem, I already said, latent graph learning, and we encounter them in many applications, including computer uh, vision problems such as few shot learning, and maybe a bit exotic high energy physics problems. And uh, in this domain, uh, uh, researchers are recently taking a, a keen interest in graph learning to analyze particle collision patterns in uh, energy detectors such as LHC or ice cube. I have already mentioned the theoretical understanding of uh, graph neural networks, and one of the big questions is their expressive power. Mm -hmm. There are already some results on the equivalence between message passing uh, neural networks and graph isomorphism tests, but these are actually very recent results from uh, just the last year. So this is definitely not the last word, and there are still many open questions that have uh, uh, interesting and important depth. Last but not least is finding some killer app. And as I said, I was expecting such an application to emerge similarly to how computer vision has emerged as one of the killer apps for traditional deep learning. And maybe it will take just a little bit more time for graphs. Now, we see graphs neural networks being applied to a lot of different problems, since graphs are universal models for relations and interactions. And they can be used to model different problems in many fields of science. You can find graph neural networks nowadays in recommender systems, in particle physics. We had a collaboration of neutrino detection with high energy physicists from the Ice Cube collaboration. Social networks I already mentioned are our startup. And there are many, many more examples. But if you ask me what would be one field on which I am willing to bet where these methods would probably make a breakthrough, I would say these are applications in medicine and biology. We can apply graphs on all scales from nano to macro for modeling molecules and interactions between molecules to patient networks. And some of these results are already extremely promising. At the nanoscale, we can model molecules as graphs and predict their properties, which is if you think the holy grail of drug design, because if you look at the search space of the all possible synthesizable mo molecules, it's humongously large, probably as large as the number of the atoms in the universe. On the other hand, what we can test in the lab experimentally or in the clinic on uh, real patients is way smaller, maybe just a few hundreds or thousands of compounds. So somehow we need to bridge this gap computationally. And here I steal the illustration from Alanis Borghuzik, who shows this computational funnel. 
And at the lower level, we have quantum mechanical models, molecular dynamics. There are some more efficient uh, and less accurate methods such as DFT or density functional theory. So graph neural networks have been proposed as cheaper alternatives. And the paper from DeepMind by Justin Gilmer, which is already uh, from 2017, quite old, showed results similar to DFT while being about four orders of magnitude faster. One doubt that you always have when you work on this kind of biological and chemical problems is that you simplify the problem too much, a kind of the spherical horse in a vacuum from a famous joke. So it, it might have been the case a couple of years ago, but probably not anymore. And GraphML is already on the radar of pharmaceutical companies. And earlier this year, the group of Collins at MIT showed the discovery of a new class of antibiotics with a machine learning pipeline that was based at least in part on graph neural network architectures. Now, drugs are typically small molecules, but their targets are usually large biomolecules, in particular proteins. And proteins are perhaps the most important molecules in our body. They play crucial roles in almost every biological process from enzymes catalyzing chemical reactions to antibodies defending us from pathogens to hemoglobin transporting oxygen to our cells. And I can go on and on. Because of their importance, it is crucial to understand how proteins work and one of the key parts to it is how they attach or bind to each other and other molecules. And it is possible to develop a new class of drugs called biologics, where the drug molecule itself is a protein or peptide, and it allows to address targets that are otherwise undruggable. With colleagues at the PFL, we have used geometric deep learning to predict protein binding and then construct new proteins from scratch, what is called de novo design. We showed that, for example, we can design proteins that disrupt the program death ligand complex that is used as the target for immunotherapy cancer drugs by binding to one of these proteins, PDL1 in particular in this example. And this approach could pave the way to a new generation of the biological anti cancer therapies. This was also my first paper in biology, and we're lucky to appear on the cover of Nature Methods in the February issue. Climbing to a higher level of abstraction, we can use graphs to model the interactions between molecules such as proteins and drugs, and the PPI graph or drug to protein interaction graph are just one example. We can use graph neural networks for drug repositioning using existing drugs for new targets, and you know that it takes about 10 years and a few billion of dollars of investment to bring a new drug to the market, so repurposing existing drugs is an attractive, cheap alternative. Now, in many cases, multiple drugs are administered at the same time. Medics call this polypharmacy or combinatorial therapy, and one risk that comes with it is adverse side effects. And with about 5,000 FDA-approved drugs on the market in the US alone, it is absolutely impossible to clinically test the side effects of all the possible billions of drug combinations. And graph neural networks were used in the work of Marinka Zitnik to predict side effects of drug combinations modeled as edges in the drug-to-drug -drug interaction graph. And side effects do not need to be necessarily banned. There might be some positive synergistic action of multiple drugs. And just a few weeks ago, there was an announcement of a collaboration funded by the Gates Foundation, in which I'm taking part together with Yosha Benjo's uh, lab Mila and the pharmaceutical startup Relation Therapeutic, where we are trying to use GraphML methods to find combinatorial treatments and drug repositioning for COVID-19, which is probably one of the most important causes nowadays in the midst, the midst of this unprecedented pandemic. I will finish with a last example that takes ideas of drug repositioning to the domain of food. Instead of drugs, we can look at drug-like molecules that are found in food. And you may know that many of the compounds found in plants belong to the same chemical classes as drugs. And not surprisingly, almost half of small molecules approved for anti-cancer therapies are derived from natural products. There's thousands of such molecules, polyphenols, flavonoids, and so on. Most of them still remain largely unexplored by nutrition experts, not tracked by regulators, and unknown to the public at large. This is truly the dark matter of nutrition. In collaboration with Kirill Veselkov from Imperial College, we used graph-based machine learning techniques to discover drug-like molecules in food, and then identify food ingredients that are the richest in such compounds that also acts synergistically and on the diverse pathways related to oncogenesis. And we have identified multiple such ingredients that we called hyperfoods. This is really the first, maybe somewhat simplistic attempt to use GraphML to predict the health effects of biologically active molecules 
in food by modeling their network effects. And in a longer perspective, our ambition is to provide a quantum leap in how our food is prescribed, designed, and prepared. And as a conceptual take on it, we have partnered with the molecular chef, Josef Youssef, who uses the ingredients we have identified to prepare simple, tasty, and affordable recipes that I invite you all to try to cook at home. I think it's probably a good moment to end on this tasty note. Probably invite me in three years time to see how much of what I have prognosticated today has materialized. Thank you very much. <laughs>